before I say anything, uh, I'm just flabbergasted and blown away by uh, the previous presentation. Can we get another round of applause for that extraordinary work? That's truly astonishing. Um, I want to thank uh, Inted for inviting me to Valencia. This is my first time in Spain, and uh, I appreciate and enjoy the experience. I appreciate the weather, because this is what my hometown looks like now. It's not really cold. This is just so, so cold for us. I also want to apologize deeply. <clears throat> Uh, for representing a country that has temporarily gone insane. Uh, more on this later. How many of you are on Twitter? Show of hands. Good, good. How many of you are tweeting now? Good, good. Keep going, keep going. Um, I've, uh, I want to have a back channel that's roaring along. Uh, I promise to jump in once I'm done talking. So the question I want to begin with is, Where is education going? What changes can we anticipate now? Now, there are many ways to forecast these futures. Personally, I recommend careful attention to science fiction, without which one really cannot grasp the 21st century. But today, I'd like to kick off the conference by exploring key trends. These are forces in the present day which we can analyze, consider, then extrapolate into the future to see how they change education. This is one of the things that we do in futures. Uh, by the way, I want to thank you all for conducting this conference in English. Um, I was hoping to be able to parler quelque chose en français. Peut-être je veux dire partout mon lecteur en français. Il toge, il y a quelque chose de russe qui y a zik. T'es bien. No, to be consistent and fair, I will remain in English. <laughs> I've been tracking these trends for years, uh, decades actually. Uh, this project of mine called the Future Trends in Technology and Education Report has about five years of solid longitudinal data. So we can take a look back and see which trends have really borne out and which ones have not. Now extrapolation can be tricky. Uh, trends can turn out in different ways. They can race ahead and reboot civilization, or they can slow down to have powerful impacts over a long duration. They can re quietly progress without media attention, or they can fizzle out. Our best option now is to assess trends in terms of their real-world impacts and then connect them with each other. This, by the way, is one of many, many photographs pointing out technological transformation. If you can't quite make this out, the chip on the left has 128 meg, the chip on the right has 128 gig. Just as a thought experiment, imagine what that chip looks like in the year 2020, if we have chips. Now, Milton Media keeps growing, and educators keep using it, and you'll see that throughout this conference. From images to podcasts, to infographics, to video, to video conferencing, we bring these media into our classes and sometimes create them. Some technologies have raced across the world and changed society, but have only slowly been hesitantly embraced by higher education. Think about mobile, think about gaming, consider social media. This, for example, uh, this slide is a screenshot of a uh, wonderful app developed with Bjork in Scandinavia. Anybody here from the Nordic countries? Uh, wonderful, I can tell because you're talking so much. Uh, this is an app called Biophilia, designed to teach science and art to kids. This is a wiki on mic cell microbiology, created and curated entirely by students. Now, if we combine these trends, we may see a new form of virtual learning environment emerge, one that integrates courseware with open content and with social media. I'm referring to the next generation digital learning environment concept a concept with lots of ideas, but unfortunately impossible to pronounce. The uh, acronym is best pronounced Endongle, but they don't like it when I say that. Now, some technology practices are slowly making progress. We are gradually exploring the possibilities of new learning spaces, shifting away from the classrooms of decades and centuries past. 
open education and open access scholarly publication see incremental growth each year, producing more content and winning new practitioners. The demand for digital literacy increases, especially as digital technology continues to reshape our lives and with a new panic about fake news. Indeed, we may start thinking about students as creators, learners as producers. Alternatives to face-to-face -face learning have grown rapidly in terms of numbers of learners. Online and hybrid or blended learning are rapidly approaching par of traditional methods. Everything I've described is not futuristic. Everything I've described is in the present, if not in the past. It's important to have all those in mind, though, because they contain seeds of the future. And they help us understand the next emerging technologies. For example, 3D printing has appeared in maker spaces, in libraries, in engineering programs, and anywhere curious academics can bring them into play. They're used for visualization, for creativity, for rapid prototyping so far. The phrase I want you to think about is 3D printing across the curriculum. Oops. Now, after a crash in the 1990s, virtual reality has returned and blossomed. We're using it for visualization, for storytelling, and curiously, for some badly needed empathy. We're also exploring combining VR with augmented reality to make mixed reality, intertwining virtual content and the physical environment. This could be another avenue for visualization or could revise our entire digital experience. And we're shrinking hardware and shrinking software. This is a small computer with Wi-Fi the size of a grain of rice. This is not futuristic. This is two and a half years old and is literally now in a museum. Think about what happens to computing when we no longer can visualize it. Blockchain technology, nobody is sure what to do with this at all. It could create a global currency alternative or fail spectacularly. It could set up an alternative to the web or not. In education, we could use blockchain to upgrade student transcripts or to create a new venue for registering scholarly achievements and discoveries. Or we could work warily around it. Now, automation, if you can't see this, this is, uh, I'm, at, I'm looking for pictures of you, Siri. No offense, Brian, but you couldn't handle my spatial resolution. Automation, and I want you to think about this in terms of a combination of artificial intelligence, robotics, big data, and algorithms, all combined. That's starting to impact education. A growing number of students and faculty research and invent in this field. Smarter programs are helping us learn languages, or to find our way across campuses, or to decide which classes to take. This is a photograph of a drone with a chainsaw. Why? because I can. <laughs> and I would ask you to guess what country this is from. Not the United States, what do you think, anybody? <laughs> I'm sorry, Spain? Japan. Japan, oh good guess, no. Russia, Russia. Russia. oh very, very close. South Korea, South Korea. no, nor, nor North Korea either. <laughs> Finland. Winters do things to people. <laughs> but we cannot examine technology in isolation. We have to situate the digital world with the other context of education. Politics, for example, and policy. Politics now in 2017 is conflicted. On the one hand, there is a general and growing demand for higher education worldwide. On the other, we see the rise of neo-nationalism in many countries, from Poland to Britain to the United States, France, and India. The question to think about is, will students and academics be free to move across borders and collaborate globally, or will they be locked into national systems? Futurists have many, many challenging trends to work with, but our most gratifying one is demographics because population trends tend to be the most predictable, the least chaotic. This chart is a chart of human history until the past century. It's a population chart sliced by ages. So the very, very bottom of the screen, you can see kids age zero to four, then five to six, 10 to 14, 15 to 19, and so on. 
And you can see that as humans, we are terrific at spamming the environment with babies. And then mortality sets in, gradually. Year by year, we lose people. This pyramid is what human history looked like until 20th century medicine. And this pyramid is also what most of the developing world looks like right now. The developed world has flipped that pyramid on its head. This is Japan. This is the most extreme example. And you can see that we are instead spamming the environment with old people and middle-aged people and fewer and fewer children. The developing world is the era of youth. The developed world is the area of old age and middle-aged, if I can speak in a gross generalization. So think about this. Think about how this works. A higher education system targeted at 18 to 22-year-olds is not going to work well in a situation like this. It's either going to face a shrinking student body or have to market itself globally. In other words, the global north may become a major education source for the global south, while the south supplies students for the north. Meanwhile, we can turn to macroeconomics because that shapes technology more than perhaps any other force. The single biggest macroeconomic force of our time is globalization, and that's changed the world. Some 20th century manufacturing giants are now service sectors, while some developing nations have become industrial powerhouses. Capital and goods flow more freely across borders than ever before in human history. Labor is more competitive and more flexible, which often means less well compensated, especially as we enter the gig economy, which in Australia they call the American economy. Um, my country likes to invent all kinds of things, I'm afraid. And yet income inequality has been building up for the past generation, especially soaring in Anglophonic countries. This is a chart derived from the work of the great economist Thomas Piketty, and you can see it measures income inequality in the vertical axis and time, the horizontal axis. And you can see now that our levels of income inequality are now like the way they were in 1910 or 1920. We call this the Great Gatsby Curve. If we combine these trends, what appears in the future of education? Recall that some trends may extend further in time or take longer to take effect. For example, climate change, the reshaping of the world into the Anthropocene, lies ahead in the decades and generations to come, although we seem to have decided as a species to do little to stop it. The Northwest Passage is now open, which you can see here in this chart, an extraordinary development for our time. Multiple nations are actually engaged in a geopolitical rush for the North Polar region, which is now opening into a new world. That's just the start. Think about what happens when snows and permafrost retreat northwards, opening up new lands for farming in Canada or in Siberia. What happens when a hot climate turns arid and desertification begins? Do more cities become like Las Vegas, artificial creations maintained solely by massive infrastructural investments? When did people flee such cities? We're now experiencing the emergence of a global higher education market. We can offer and take digital classes across continents. We have growing access to educational and scholarly materials. Universities are increasingly competing with each other across these national boundaries. I suspect that unless neo-nationalist governments become deeply autocratic and truly stupid, this global university system will continue to grow. Technological advancement should continue, with devices shrinking, computation moving further into our personal spaces, more of the world networked, more of the world annotated, robots filling our skies in crowded cities, virtual content humming before our eyes. Add to that a steady stream of newly invented hardware and software. The proliferation of digital content and discussion will continue to challenge our ability to handle it. We can expect a battle between those seeking to establish new gatekeeping sources, new authorities, either human-based or algorithmic and automated, versus those that wish to teach digital literacy to people, to citizens, to migrants, in order to empower them individually. That battle is already shaping up right now. You can see this being waged by Facebook and Google to begin with. We may also see the educational businesses 
educational business models destroyed while new ones appear. The triumph of open education and open access and scholarly publishing could well destroy textbook companies and scholarly publishers. Universities who base their funding on student debt, by the way, that's another American invention, please do not copy this. Um, I still owe student debt. Um, if I die, that debt does not disappear, so I may pass that debt on to my children. Uh, the total amount of American uh, debt is $1.3 trillion. Does it make you want to try that? No. But universities who base their funding model on student debt may not be able to sustain themselves on students accustomed to open content in a competitive global marketplace. Now, automation is one of the biggest game changers. And I just want to read this little tweet to you because I keep coming back to it every day. This is from one of the Google leaders. In the long run, I think we will evolve in computing from a mobile-first world to an AI-first world. So think about this. When you design courseware, when you design email, when you publish websites, nowadays we increasingly design them assuming that the audience is going to be reading them on a phone or on a tablet or some other mobile device. We don't do enough of this in education, but there it is. What happens if we redesign everything in terms of AI first? What does your library software look like? What does a virtual learning environment look like? What does your campus homepage look like? Now, let's consider what happens as automated services take on more educational functions. Let's grant steady further growth in deep learning and advanced neural networks. Let's just count Google's victory over the game Go as a milestone, and let's just accept Siri's uncanny abilities as a baseline. What happens to a professoriate when competent digital tutors can successfully compete with humans for a student's time? What happens to a learner's initiative and sense of self when a university can, with growing confidence, predict their likely educational outcomes? A good friend of mine is a meteorologist, teaches at the University of Michigan, and he can now, with about 90% certainty, predict if a student will pass or fail his class one week into the class. Think about what that means for advising, for resources. Just think about if he has that ability and doesn't use it, is it actually ethical to not use it? What kind of professional training and development prepares instructors to work closely with automated devices in teaching and doing research? Which researcher will be the first to offer an AI co-authorship credit in an article? Second, think of the world beyond education as automation takes hold. The past generation of digital advancement has seen new businesses, a great deal of money, huge fortunes made, but by employing very, very few people. In my country, when Kodak went out of business, in one city, it employed 64,000 people, all unemployed. At the same time, Instagram had about 300 staff. What does the world look like when that repeats and continues? If a generation of automation leads to underemployment and unemployment, what becomes of a university's mission? Are you preparing students in part for a lifetime of leisure? Or are you preparing them truly for lifelong learning? If, on the other hand, jobs continue to exist, but are so deeply intertwined with technology that workers are effectively, conceptually, cyborgs, are universities prepared to overhaul their curriculum and pedagogy to help students into that new world? We should not be surprised that chaos and uncertainty result, especially as our technologically empowered students using devices and practices we teach them, react to this emerging world and try and improve their lives. We should expect both insurgency and creativity. Some of that creativity will appear in digital storytelling, because we know from the entire record of history that whenever humans invent a new communication medium, we tell stories through it. 
That was true of radio, of television, of print, of a long playing record, of radio, of computer games, and of social media. Keep watching for storytelling. So, faced with that glimpse of the far future of, say, the next five years, what do you do now? What can you do? First, collaborate with each other across institutions, across sectors, nations, across populations and professions. That's what this conference can help do. That's what you guys are doing now on Twitter. Quick show of hands, how many of you are still tweeting? How many of you are beginning to enter a coma stage? I can't take this anymore, this is too crazy. You should use social media. This is the world's cheapest and most powerful professional development tool. You should use open and be open. Share your experiences. Share what you're learning and what you're discovering so other people can benefit. There's always somebody in this world who will be able to learn from your experience with Moodle, with mobile devices, with cameras. And to really stretch, rethink everything in terms of automation. Imagine what that can do to change everything. And think of these guys. I live in a part of America that is low technology. Uh, my wife and I, we heat our house entirely by firewood, half of which we cut ourselves. Uh, we lose power once a month. Uh, we get water from a well. These students are uh, secondary school students, and they were in a project where they had to build 3D printed models of historical sites. They had to go into their community, do research in primary and secondary documents, reproduce a building online, and then print it out in 3D. And look at these kids. Look how calm they are, how cool. I mean, they're teenagers, they're automatically cool. <laughs> but think about the world we're giving them. Right? Think about the world of climate change, the world of Trump and Brexit, the world of technology. Think hard about them, not about us right now. Think about what is happening to them and what kind of world we're building for them. And then better yet, think about what they'll do with it. Imagine yourself inhabiting different worlds. Imagine your children inhabiting these worlds. Imagine the generation after that. Because you help make this future with all these trend lines, all these powerful forces coinciding and impinging on you. You help make it. The future isn't something just done to you. It's not given to you. Every decision you make contributes. When you craft a creative work, or you teach in a certain way, or nudge a campus in one direction, or support a political candidate, or tell a story, or dream out loud, or influence younger folks, you help co-create what is coming up next. Don't be passive. It's too late for that. You're already making it happen. You are all, each of you, world makers. In effect, practicing futurists. Please do so with open eyes and with the flame of creative possibility roaring in your heart. Have a good conference. Thank you.